surviving. <laughs> <laughs> Intense, of course. <laughs> We're going, going for the pub tomorrow evening. <laughs> I hope you can do it. I already yeah. so far, you know. Yes. <laughs> I, I've made a light conversation. <laughs> yeah, so we have um uh we have two Zoom, you know. We we do Zoom hopping. <laughs> So it's uh it's very convenient. We do different things in the we cannot do uh actually uh yeah so after we will have to go to the other Zoom afterwards. Uh because okay, for uh, the workshop. Yeah, for the workshop because we other in this in this Zoom we cannot do um uh, breakout rooms. Because this is a you know, we it's this is a webinar, so we have attendees as well. And if we want to have attendees, we, it's not compatible with breakout rooms. But we have uh, the breakout okay. room for this workshop, isn't it? Everybody working individually as such. If for the workshop, we'll have to go to the workshop. Uh, so now we have a lecture. Yeah, I know. But we have actually break up uh, uh, occasion for this particular workshop since everybody's yeah, But there. not for the lecture. So right now we have a lecture. So afterwards we will go to the, uh, to the workshop Zoom. But uh, now I would like to um, welcome Giselle Miranda who is from the uh, Bioimage Informatics facility that I just presented in the other Zoom. And um, yes, she's going to explain a little bit also how the facility works, I think. Giselle, thank you very much for being here. Yes, so, uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the welcome. Uh, it's nice to be here again. It's uh, another edition of the LCI course, and I... I come at the end to talk about the introduction to image analysis, so I hope you're not too tired, uh, And but I promise that will also be uh, fun. Uh, and I also have my colleagues from uh, AIDA Data Hub, I don't know if they're already here, but we will have Eric and Emre during the, the workshop. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, let me first... Uh, share here the screen so as sylvie uh, mentioned i work yeah, yeah, at the yeah, sorry. Image. sorry this is eric uh, Ilipa. Okay. hello what's the, his last name oh yeah sorry is that eric Ilipay? yes Ili Ilipay. yeah okay i promote him on the panelist okay thank you okay yeah so uh yeah so right now we will have an introduction uh which will also be like uh with some concepts of image analysis that we are going to use during the workshop but this lecture is also an overview of the field uh, and a bit of what we do at the bioimage informatics facility uh, handling projects uh, with different aspects of, of bioimage analysis so this is an outline of my presentation, and I will start with some concepts and examples. Then we will go through some uh, basic concepts on uh, digital images. And we are going to talk also about how to ensure image quality for image analysis. And then we are going through image processing, and uh, we are going to see what is a typical bioimage analysis workflow. And I will briefly discuss some machine and deep learning methods and some final remarks. So let's start then. So what is bioimage analysis? And here sometimes I'm going to shift to image analysis as well. But when we talk about bioimages, about bio we want to understand and, and quantify uh, microscopy and medical image data. So we want to be able to extract uh, information from images. Here in this example, for instance, we want to quantify fluorescence intensity in the nuclei. So then we can analyze profile across experimental groups, for instance. So we are going from images to numbers and numbers to knowledge. And this is a process that is quantitative because we are obtaining uh, some quantitative measures, measurements at the end. It's also objective. So we have uh, defined a goal. What do we want to extract from images? Do we want to analyze the intensity? Do we want to analyze shape of objects? It's also, it, it should also be reliable uh, in the sense that uh, the methods we are applying uh, will lead us to, to reach this goal, to reach, the, to reach this objective and should be repeatable. So if we repeat this process, uh, we will get the same results and also reproducible in the sense that if someone else 
uh, applies the same methods on our data, it will reach the same results. And this is, uh, there is now a great demand uh, to computational tools uh, uh, to analyze such uh, data. And this is due to advances in microscopy techniques. So I'm sure that during the course, you saw a lot of uh, advancements, uh, different uh, microscopy techniques. So we have uh, light sheet, for instance, generating a lot of data, uh, but also yeah, microscopy, for instance, we have more fluorescent, uh, more sensitive fluorescent labels and sensors, high throughput data creation. So we are in the big data era. And consequently, we also need increase the storage capacity, but we also have faster compute, uh, computing uh, computers and better algorithms to handle such data. And why we need automated analysis? Well, it's faster than humans, of course, but, but it's also a less biased approach and we cannot visually or manually analyze such data. So we can say that we are here at the intersection of these three uh, fields, computer science, for uh, the com computer vision and machine learning techniques, uh, but also good knowledge of biology is required to understand the biological processes taking place. And, and finally, statistics as well, in order to evaluate and analyze the results and, and possibly draw uh, conclusions. So this field is also known as uh, bioimage uh, informatics. You will also uh, find this uh, name in literature. So let's see more in practice than what we are talking about. And here are some examples of projects that uh, have been involved in the context of the facility. So uh, in this example, we wanted to quantify uh, expression protein levels uh, in uh, in the context of testis microenvironment so analyzing adult human spermatogenesis and here we are working with average intensity uh, expressed uh, in each cell and this is multiplexed imaging and here we used an approach based on a pixel based classification to analyze if the signal is positive is negative uh, so to analyze the level of expression. So we are talking about average fluorescence intensity. But uh, we can also analyze the structures. So in this an other project here, uh, we used bioimage analysis to assess the structural and functional changes in the epithelium in the, in the presence of uh, HIV. So we, the goal was to understand the quality of the protective epithelial border, how it changes in the presence of infection. Uh, in this other uh, example here, we have a time series of calcium activity. So uh, the goal was to analyze how uh, to characterize uh, the beating pattern of, car of cardiomyocytes uh, when exposure to, exposed to different physiological stress and toxic substances. And we used an approach uh, based on spatial frequency analysis. So we characterized for each group uh, the, the beating uh, pattern of the cardiomyocyte. So the frequency, it's a frequency analysis. Uh, I have also another example here. And the goal uh, in this project was to out, uh, automate, uh, uh, it was an automated detection uh, method to analyze the vascular changes in tumor uh, draining lymph nodes. And here, the interesting thing is that the researchers, they manually annotated more than 17,000 uh, vessels. So we could use this data to, for instance, uh, we could apply deep learning here uh, to uh, classify the pattern and when it deviates from the normal, uh, from the normal pattern of, of, of the, the vessel uh, growth. And this is another example with uh, time-lapse images. And here the goal was to um, characterize the microtubule uh, plus N tracking protein. Uh, so here we used an approach uh, by using morphological operators plus 3D segmentation and cell labeling to, uh, and, the, and here in yeast, 
So it's also another example of uh, time lapse data and how we can characterize like uh, growth and, and in this case tracking uh, the microtubule uh, plus end protein. And the last uh, the last example I want to show is uh, it, it's related to in situ sequencing. So this is a very rich data because we have uh, besides the uh, gene expression uh, data, we also have uh, the spatial uh, components of the data. So you can do, for instance, cell clustering uh, and analyze uh, different cell-cell uh, interactions in tissue. So I hope I have motivated you with these examples. Of course, it goes much beyond uh, these examples, what you can do uh, by applying bioimage analysis methods. So, but one key thing here is to define your scientific question. And I'm sure that during the course you were already uh, in, inspired uh, or motivated to define your scientific goal, your scientific question. Uh, and I would also add, how does it involve image analysis? So how can you include uh, how, uh, what tools you're going to need uh, to reach your goal? Uh, so with this overview, I will then talk a bit about basic concepts of digital images. Uh, I'm sure that some of these concepts you, you cover during the course, but uh, here is a, is a brief overview. So when we talk about digital images, we have to remember that an image is a matrix of numbers. So every image can be represented by these 2D matrix, matrix with a certain number of rows and a certain, a certain number of columns and a specific pixel value. So here, for instance, this is the pixel inspector tool in Fiji. Uh, and you can see uh, if you click uh, on a specific part of the image, you will see the pixel values. Uh, but how is the pixel value defined? And so the pixel value depends on the acquisition system. So it's a process of transforming the light signal into digital signal, and it involves a sensor, which can be, for instance, detector-based, camera-based, which will transform the photos and electrons. The signal will be amplified, and then we have the conversion from voltage to digital uh, signal. So the pixel, uh, the, the pixel intensities, for instance, will depend on the on the sensor and the range of values that you can represent as well. Uh, another example for co uh, color images, we have Bayer filter, for instance, for color cameras. Then you have blue, green, and red channels. This is used, for instance, in digital cameras to create a color image. So depending on your sensor, you will have a specific bit depth. So the bit depth corresponds to the number of gray levels. And the number of gray levels is defined by 2 to the power n being n the bit depth. So if you have only one bit, you can represent only two intensities, two grayscale values, so black and white. This is used, for instance, when we want to represent the result of a segmentation and you want to uh, separate uh, background from, from foreground. Uh, we have, with 8 bits, we can represent 256 values going from 0 to 255. So most of the images that you work with, for instance, uh, uh, that you download from the internet or that you can display in your computer, they, they are 8-bit images. Uh, but microscopy formats, usually we have 12 bits or 16 bits. And as you can see, we can represent much a uh, higher uh, range of uh, grayscale values. So the number of uh, the bit depth defines the number of possible intensity values. So more bits, more fine intensity details, and lower the risk of saturation. So more bits are usually better, but uh, sometimes you can have lower bit depth as well. So if you have a storage limit, uh, when you have very thin samples, uh, etc. Well, when it comes to color images, uh, we have examples of uh, yeah from from microscopy, like for instance H uh, and E stained uh, tissue samples. Uh, in this case, the image is then each channel has its own um, 
matrix of values. So each uh, uh, value in, in the matrix now is, can be represented by the components in the red, green, and blue uh, channel. So this is a colored image. And we can, of course, uh, split these channels to analyze. So we can uh, split in the RGB space. So if I split this uh, sample image here, you can see the differences in each, uh, in each channel. But we can also uh, divide or uh, split the channels according to the dyes. So there is a technique called, uh, called the color deconvolution uh, that can be used, for instance, to perform spectral unmixing of the dyes. So it takes advantage of um, the optical density of the dyes, in this case, the methoxylene, and uh, using, and also background here is the, the last image. Uh, and the advantage here is that you, it's much easier, for instance, th this, is, this can be a pre-processing technique if you want to further, for instance, count the nuclei here, so you can easily segment. But fluorescent images, uh, they, are, they are actually represented by independent, they have an independent channel representation. So this image here, for instance, can be uh, separated in these three components. And if we take the green channel, each of them, if it's on uh, matrix representation, and if we take the green channel here, uh, we can even change the color. We can change how this image is displayed. And for that, we use the lookup table, which is basically color coding. So it's the same information, but uh, shown in different, uh, in different colors, in different color scale. But the important thing is that the original values are not modified. It's just the, uh, their representation, their visualization that is being modified. But why we would do that, right? Why we would change the representation here? Well, there are different reasons for that. Uh, here we have an example of a thresholded image. Uh, and and this, this is actually a segmentation result. So we have a background and foreground represented here. So we can say that this is kind of lookup table showing us the result of a segmentation, showing us the blobs and the background. But besides that, change the lookup table can also be used for two when you're labeling components, for instance, to highlight instance-based segmentation. So before, uh, uh, besides uh, se uh, segmenting each blob, we also want to characterize them individually. So using a look a lookup table, for instance, that labels each individual, uh, that shows each labeled component in a specific color helps us to uh, uh, vis uh, visualize the data, especially when you have clustered objects like cells or nuclei. Another example of lookup table is the high load lookup table to detect saturation and other exposure. Uh, so this is a lookup table that shows in red when you have the maximum value in, a, in the intensity range and in blue, uh, the lowest um, intensity. So here we can see that it's saturated and but also underexposed. And this can be useful uh, even during acquisition, you can use this lookup table uh, to avoid saturation and other, uh, and art, uh, other artifacts. Uh, another important concept when dealing with images and that, uh, brings that contains a lot of information about your data. It's a histogram. So if we recall from the statistics, the histogram is the distribution of a variable, right? And here we are analyzing the distribution of the pixel intensities. So these histograms were obtained in Fiji and Fiji already shows uh, to us like some basic uh, statistics here as well, like the most frequent value, maximum value, minimum, and so on. So we can see here, uh, and the convention uh, is that the, the brightest, the brighter the region, the higher the value. So here in this histogram, for instance, we can see a peak uh, in somewhere here, the maximum is 253, so quite close of the, the maximum intensity. Uh, but when, if we look at this other image here, then we can see that the peak is more to the left or the, the, dark, uh, the darker values. So the, the the mode here is 17, for instance. 
uh, but and of course the pixel order does not affect the histogram and basic measurements you can derive from histograms is if analyze the mean intensity, analyze variance, the standard deviation, and, and so on. So it's uh, really important to uh, understand how to interpret the, the, the histogram. Uh, another concept, and uh, this we work a lot uh, when visual visualizing the image, interpreting the image, is uh, sometimes we enhance the contrast, for instance, to see uh, uh, to see to better visualize the structures, for instance. So when we talk about brightness, it's we're talking basically ab about um, uh, about the amount of signal, the amount of light. So if we compare images A and B, we can see clearly that B is brighter than A, right? And contrast is related to the maximum difference in intensity. So if I uh, if we have a look at the both histograms of both images, we can see that the image on the right has a higher contrast. So the image on the left, the range is between zero and 166. And here on the right, we can see that the range is between zero and two and 255. So we do that to better visualize the image. And if you're in Fiji, you have here uh, the brightness and, and contrast window where you can, for instance, click auto to automatically uh, uh, readjust uh, the, the range. Uh, another uh, important thing when inspecting the images is also uh, the dimension of the images. So we have, for instance, 2D images with certain uh, value of width and height, but uh, we can also have 3D images. Uh, so we have a, this is an example of a three-dimensional image. So we have width, height, but we also have a stack. And here is an, the last one is an example of a 5D image. So besides uh, the three dimensions, we also have two channels and it's a time lapse. It's a mitosis, it's representing a mitosis. So an image may have at most five dimensions. So it's important to uh, analyze also this information. And in Fiji, if you're working in Fiji, uh, you can see here uh, channels, the size of the Z stack and the time frame. Uh, well, image metadata can come from uh, both like the experimental setup, uh, so for instance, protocols, probes, treatments. It can also be related to uh, acquisition parameters, so filters, gain, exposure time. But uh, also, uh, it can also contain outputs from processing and analysis techniques. So if you are, uh, you can have, for instance, uh, information about each cell, about about each nucleus, and uh, so these are uh, more related to analytic uh, metadata. Uh, but it's also uh, uh, good to, uh, for instance, in Fiji, you can access uh, this metadata, and it's usually generated or uh, encapsulated in a proprietary format, uh, uh, depending on the microscope. And we then uh, we can also make a link with file formats. So we have different file formats in microscopy, which can be proprietary formats. Uh, so for instance, in Econ software, you will see then the two extension, uh, ZEISS, the CZI extension, and they usually uh, and they uh, they store metadata like that that we mentioned in the previous slide. But we also have more general file formats. Uh, we have JPEG, for instance, that is lossy compression, so you can lose information here. So we don't use JPEG actually to uh, to analyze images, like to, to do image processing, image analysis. Uh, TIFF is a lossless format and stores metadata, and now so you can um, represent stacks as TIFF files. So that's a quite uh, uh, it's a very common uh, format. Uh, used and PNG used mainly for transfer and display. No stacks possible here. And finally, we also have file formats for uh, figures like uh, uh, in, in a vector uh, format like SVG, PDF, 
So the advantage of SVG files is that when you uh, when you uh, when you zoom in, when you maximize uh, uh, the image, so you won't lose quality. So it's a vector-based format, but it's used mainly for uh, like publications and so on. And if you're also working in Fiji, so uh, I know I have different softwares for image analysis, but I, I'm, I'm mentioning uh, Fiji here more often because we're going to work with it uh, during the workshop. Uh, and also it's one of the most used softwares for image analysis and Fiji has a plugin uh, for uh, the, uh, the bioformats, um, sorry, the bioformats plugin, which can be used to read all these different uh, bioformats. Bioformats is not only for Fiji, you can find it for Python as well, MATLAB. So it's a, a, it can be used to read these different file formats. So a good practice, it's always keep the original files and uh, refer to the acquisition software for the original metadata. Well, so this was like some basic concepts uh, on how to interpret images, how to visualize them. Uh, but another important uh, topic is how to ensure image quality for image analysis. And I think you also covered a bit uh, during the course or more extensive uh, uh, about some of these topics. But here I'm going to uh, relate how, what we can do if some of them we can correct at the level of image analysis. Uh, or meaning after acquisition. So there are some artifacts that cannot be corrected and they should necessarily be corrected during the image acquisition. And that's the case of saturation, bleed through, for instance. So let's have a look. Uh, histograms, they help to identify saturation. So for instance, here we have the same uh, picture, but in different conditions. So the first one underexposed, uh, on the right one, we have the overexposed version, so you can see how the histogram varies. And uh, here, for instance, on uh, with the underexposed histogram, we lose the details, we lose the edges, for instance. Uh, and now, so on the overexposed, so objects may appear larger here. So that's why it's important to uh, not saturate and not underexpose the image. It's also important to avoid saturation when you have when you are comparing across images. So if you have one image that is saturated, you are already saying that oh, that's the highest intensity that I can have, right? So that's why that's why it's important to avoid saturation, and that's nothing you can do uh, from the image analysis uh, side that to correct that. Bleed through is another example. Bleed through. Uh, compromises the intensity and shape measures, and we are going to see, we will have a practical exercise about it uh, in the, during the workshop. Uh, so here on the first row, we have like sequential uh, acquisition, uh, but, and here we have simultaneous acquisition on the, on the bottom row. And here we can see the, 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 the bleed through. So this also compromises co-localization analysis. So if you're performing, if you're analyzing two uh, specific markers and you want to analyze how they co-localize, if you have bleed through, then the measurements won't be reliable anymore. And so you have to fix it in the acquisition time. Uh, bit conversion is, should also be, uh, uh, you have to use it with caution. So for instance, if you, go, if you want to go from eight bit to 16 bit, uh, so if you want to do that, the bit depth does not change the pixel values actually. So you have an image with a, in a lower bit range. And if you want to transform that to 16 bit, the pixel values won't change. But when decreasing, scale can or not be applied. So for instance, if you want to go from 16 bit to eight bit, then you can use uh, here as, uh, as an example in Fiji, uh, how to, set these conversions with scale and without scale. Uh, so if you scale, then the whole range of your 16-bit image will be scaled to the 8-bit range. 
But if you don't scale, then all the, uh, the, the, the pixel intensities that exceed the maximum in the 8-bit range will be 255. So you should take care with conversions as well. But why do we convert? <laughs> why, why do we do that? Well, conversions should be applied with caution. But for instance, there are some specific plugins in Fiji that were developed for 8-bit images. So you may need to, uh, to, to do the bit conversion, for instance, if you need to use those plugins. So it's always good to keep the original image. And uh, if you need to process, uh, then you can copy, uh, you can duplicate the image and then convert and then use the plugin that you need. Other image operations um, that are also, that cannot be fixed. So it, contrast enhancement, uh, if saved. So I showed, uh, we talked about brightness and contrast before. Uh, and here, uh, if you try to apply, for instance, in Fiji, it will uh, issue a uh, warning for uh, to you, like, do you want to save? Uh, this will modify the pixel intensities, for instance. So if you save that, uh, then of course you will lose the original value. So a good practice is always to create a copy of the original image when working with Fiji. Well, other artifacts can be corrected, but sometimes it's better to correct them while, while acquiring the images. So here are things that we can do with image processing. So denoising is one example, and this we do uh, a lot, uh, actually, as a pre-processing step. So here you can see the filtered image and the original noise image. Uh, stabilization, are, here you have an example of a, uh, a small drift here highlighted in green and how it was corrected uh, in, in, in the second uh, part of uh, in, in the second part. So this is also uh, uh, necessary. You have to correct this before you do any further processing. So these are examples of things that can be uh, corrected. Illumination correction, we will also have, um, uh, we will also have an example on the, the workshop. Uh, here's an example of vignetting. So, so this is a mosaic image, right? A, a, a stitched image, and we can see the mosaic, uh, like the, the, the tiles here, and the corrected version. So there are uh, methods to correct uh, uneven illumination. And here on the right, we have the uh, same example and the corrected pair. Yeah, and uh, so this is my last example on, on how to ensure image quality. Uh, it also goes beyond, but uh, it's good to uh, make a, a link here with the acquisition. So uh, whatever you can correct uh, during the acquisition, it will make our life easier also and uh, when processing and analyzing uh, this image. So we saw some examples of bioimage analysis. We saw some uh, uh, a brief introduction on, on, on uh, digital images and we saw how to ensure quality. So now we will move to uh, how to analyze. Uh, here first talking a bit about pre-processing and enhancement. Uh, so an example here could be noise uh, removal, for instance. So image operations, they are designed to modify or enhance properties such as edges, uh, corners and blobs. So we can, for instance, denoise an image, we can detect edges, uh, or we can blur an image. And we are going to see why we do that sometimes. So these are all examples of uh, uh, image enhancement and pre-processing. They can be performed in both the spatial domain and in the frequency domain. Uh, so if we remember that an image is a matrix of numbers, we can now we, we can perform some uh, basic operations, basic arithmetic operations here. So if we take this image as an example... Can I just interrupt for a second, just to say that what you said before, uh, just to relate it to the lecture, uh, when you said the uh, spatial uh, domain and the frequency domain, this is the Fourier transform that I was talking about yesterday, just to relate it, because I didn't use the frequency domain word, so that people know. 
we're talking about the no, stuff okay. that the Fourier transform. Yeah. Yeah, we are going to see an example also. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, well, here we have uh, segmentation masks of the the cell, the nuclei, and also the outlines, right, of the cell and the nuclei. And we can perform some basic arithmetics here. So maybe you want to measure intensity only on the cytoplasm. So you can exclude from the uh, the cell out, uh, outline. You can exclude the area. Uh, uh, you can exclude the nuclei. So you can combine these different uh, uh, masks here. More uh, a bit more advanced, you can also apply filters to images. And one uh, uh, very much used class of filters are convolution filters. Uh, and they involve uh, the definition of a kernel. So imagine that you have uh, in your original image and you will convolve this image with a specific kernel and you will have your filter Im filtered image. And you can, uh, this kernel has different shapes. Uh, so it can, you can define a kernel to detect border, to denoise, and this operation here is known as convolution. And how does it work? Just to give a simple example. So if you have here this uh, matrix, your original image here, or part of it, then you can convolve this image with your kernel. So for each pixel of your image here, we have example of these pixels here, 100, you will multiply uh, by this uh, matrix and sum the values. And in the final image, in the filtered image, this will be the new value of that, of that pixel. So each pixel in the original image is multiplied by the corresponding value in the kernel and then summed. And then you can design this kernel for specific tasks. And here we have the average filter, the mean filter. So this is a practical example. This is also used during acquisition. You can uh, also define uh, if, you, uh, if you, you use a mean filter, an average filter or not during acquisition as well. And as the name says, we are uh, finding the average value. So again, if we take part of our uh, a specific region of our original image, and then we are going to uh, do the average of this region and then the pixel in the filtered image will have a new value. But this is performed for every pixel. And then we compute the sum again, and then we will have uh, the new value of the second pixel. And here, just uh, as a comparison here, now we have the median filter. So the median is, uh, first we sort the values in this neighborhood, then we take the uh, the value at the center, the median value. And this will be the value assigned to the pixel. So these are the differences between the mean and median. We are going to use also uh, these two filters in the workshop. And uh, in a more, well, let's illustrate then in a more practical way here, the difference. So if you have such an image where it's it's mainly dark, but you have one bright pixel here, right? So if you use the mean filter, what will happen actually is that you will, this region, you will smooth this image, this region, and you will have here, uh, well, this is the final result, right? Because they're averaging values. But if you use median filter, it will be uh, cut out because it will, from this neighborhood here, uh, this will be, uh, at the end of the, if you sort the values of this neighborhood, this will be at the end. So this won't be the median value. So if you want to eliminate what we call salt and pepper noise, actually the median filter is the best one. So uh, the idea here is to show that depending on what you want to do, uh, depending on the type of noise you want to uh, remove, then maybe one filter is better than the other. So there is no Best filter, what uh, best filter for all situations, but there is uh, one that fits better each purpose. So the median filter can be used for noise reduction, and here we don't have new values. No new values are created. In the case of the mean filter, we average, so sometimes we may have a new value, a new pixel intensity. But it's also more time consuming because you have to sort the values. So 
if you have a bigger neighborhood, then it can take more time. And here you have the comparison again of original median filtered and mean filtered images. So these are uh, examples of convolution filters. Uh, and another, well, one parameter that you can tune, at least in Fiji, for instance, is how big the kernel will be. Uh, it will, and it can have not only how big, but it can have different shapes as well. So you can choose a kernel like this or the eight connected, uh, which is the one I was using the examples before. And you can also have here, for instance, five per five. And then what happens as the neighborhood increases, right? What is the difference? So let's have a look uh, also applied to the HeLa cells example. So here we have the median filter applied to these uh, nucleus here with radios uh, two, or th that's the size of the, the kernel, four and six. So we can see that the effect becomes uh, more pronounced. Uh, how big it should be, it also depends on the size of your objects. Uh, if the particles you want, or you want to filter out are small, are big. So it, it depends. It will always depend on the size of the objects. But be aware that the, the higher the value, then the more pronounced the effect. In this case, it, it's a smoothing filter. And uh, so, as I said, you can define your own kernel. If we think about edges, for instance, edge detection is a very important pre-processing step for many uh, object detection and recognition uh, tasks. Uh, one one simple uh, one example is, for instance, the preweight operator. So we have uh, these two kernels to filter both, like in a vertical and horizontal. So uh, you can see that it's you're basically finding subtracting uh, uh, the uh, like here the right side from the left uh, the left side from the right side and vice versa uh, for horizontal and, and vertical um, detection. So bell operator as well. So cust customized kernels can be implemented uh, in Fiji uh, for specific tests. So these are just examples how to uh, use these kernels. But there are other examples of uh, filters. So a Gaussian filter, um, very much used as well. So it's used to blur images and remove detail and noise. Uh, computationally efficient, rotationally sym symmetric, right? If we look at the bell-shaped kernels here. Uh, and the degree of smoothing is given by the standard deviation. So here you can see, for instance, yeah, I still like the clown example and the Gaussian filter. And why we do that? Why we blur images? Well, it it can help other uh, steps in the image analysis pipeline. So when you blur, you have a more homogeneous region here. If we look at the uh, the white part here of the close to the eye of the of the clown. So this can help, for instance, when applying a thresholding or other segmentation technique. The, these are other examples of filters. I'm not going to detail here, but for you to know that there are different classes of filters. So these filters are more related to the morphology of objects. So they describe shapes by using another shape as a test probe. So if you have this binary set here, these two components, this bigger component and the smaller compon component, then you have a filter called dilation that will dilate the bigger component based on the smaller component. And the erosion and the final result here, as you can see, they are now the two uh, connected. Sorry, B is the, the structuring element. And after we apply dilation here, we connect the N. And similar here, erosion operation, uh, so you do that to decrease the size of objects. And objects that were connected before can be can then be separated. And this can be interesting, uh, for instance, if you want to separate cells, if you want to separate clustered nuclei. And here's an example of both in the first world for binary images and in the second world for, for grayscale images, how dilation and erosion uh, works. Uh, and the, more interesting, the goal again, the goal here is that you, you don't need to uh, uh, 
decorate here what each filter does, but you can combine these uh, dilation and erosion uh, uh, operations to create other filters. So for instance, to uh, for boundary detection, edge enhancement, and so on. So you can do like uh, different things with these uh, morphological filters. You can combine them to, uh, to create more complex operations. And the last thing I wanted to mention about filter, uh, Sylvie already uh, uh, yeah, mentioned that you uh, saw uh, something, uh, you covered Fourier transform. We can also filter images in the frequency domain. And the way we do that is using the Fourier transform. So the image that you have here is the representation of the, uh, sorry, the image that you have here on the right is the representation of the image on, on the left uh, in the frequency domain. And then we can filter by frequency. We can have low pass filters, we can have high pass filters. So usually edges and noises, they are high, uh, they have higher frequency. So if you use a high pass filter, for instance, uh, we can see here that what is remaining is basically like the noise and the edges of the neuron. And low pass filter will highlight the more constant regions or, or uh, not the borders, for instance. So we can uh, we can also use filtering in the frequency domain. Okay, so well, we saw lots of lots of uh, so many different filters here. Uh, let's then talk a bit about the image analysis workflow. Well, there is a pathway here, right? Going from sample preparation to image acquisition, and this was covered mainly in the in the uh, in in the previous classes, right? Uh, and then, so if you you have to ensure quality here, so we will make our life easier also uh, when you start the image analysis. So one of the first steps in this pathway in this uh, image analysis workflow is to pre-process the image. Do you, first of all, do you need to do that? Do you need to reduce noise? Uh, do you need to perform background subtraction? Do you need to filter? So these are things you can do to enhance the image. Then uh, in many tasks, involves segmentation, which is basically the separation of foreground for, uh, from the background. So you want to be able to separate cells, you want to be able to separate nuclei. So this is called segmentation, and there are different techniques here as well. When you have this uh, binary mask, then you can uh, post-process it. So you may not want to analyze this, um, this object here at the border. You cannot see the whole object. So you have to eliminate it. So I can use a filter to say, no, this uh, I want to cut out. I don't have the whole object here. Or maybe this is not segmented correctly. There is a weird shape here. So I will filter that by circularity, for instance. So this is called post-processing, which you can then refine the binary mask that you obtain it via segmentation, uh, but also lab label objects. And finally, you can quantify. You can uh, extract measurements uh, and then do statistical analysis. And a note here is that AI tools, they can be used in different parts of this uh, workflow. So they can be used, for instance, uh, for pre-processing or for segmenting. So imagine that we want to quantify uh, the beta catenin translocated from the cell membrane to the cytoplasm and nucleus. Uh, how would you do that, right? So this is your task and you, uh, we have to create a workflow for that. So one thing that we can do first is to analyze each channel individually. So I would split the channels. And here we have a better overview of uh, each uh, individual marker. So for instance, you have DAPI, uh, for the nuclei, you have uh, phalloidine for marking the actin, which you can use, for instance, to get the cell shape. Because if you want to quantify the translocation from the cell membrane to the cell cytoplasm and nucleus, you will need the outlines of both uh, the nucleus uh, and the cell. So then we segment and then we label each individual component. Finally, we can then extract measurements and hopefully 
obtain a table like this, where you, you have for each object, you have specific measures that you define. And finally, analyze it across uh, different experimental groups. So if we summarize the workflow, we can split the images in separate channels. Then we get the outlines of the nuclei from the DAP image. Then we can get the outlines of the cytoplasm from the actin image. And finally, measure the beta catenin in the area defined by the outlines. So uh, I would say that the mo most complex tasks here would be get the outlines. They involve a lot of, uh, uh, of, of different uh, steps here. So I see how much time do I have? I lost. And you have until 10 past. So another until nine past. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, so um, how do we get these outlines? So these are our, uh, they represent our regions of interest or ROIs. Uh, well, we can annotate them manually, right? So in Fiji, you have different annotation tools. You have the ROI manager where for each annotated object you can include and you can do things like, for instance, you can measure, you can uh, you, you can measure intensity, shape, and so on. Uh, but they can also be obtained via segmentation, right? In a in a big image, uh, you or if you have a big data set, you cannot do this manually. And it's also less biased if, biased if you use a an automated segmentation approach. And here we have different examples. So you can uh, ROIs can be, for instance, part of a tissue. They can be nuclei. Uh, they can be cell membrane, uh, uh, the region like in the cell membrane. So you want just like this ring shape around the cell membrane. You want to quantify the intensity there, for instance. So they can have, otherwise can have different shapes. Uh, so segmentation separates the objects of interest from the background. And uh, threshold thresholding methods, they are the simplest segmentation approaches. So you go from the image to the binary mask and the labeled mask. Uh, if you are in Fiji, if you're working with Fiji, you have different thresholding options. So one thing to notice here is that if you choose a different method, uh, you have different segmentation results. And that's a common doubt like when, when, uh, uh, when people come to me and say, but how, how do I define which one is the best? Well, here is it's something that you, it, it's really a trial, trial and error. So you should uh, test the different methods and see the ones, uh, the one that uh, uh, is most appropriate for your data. But most importantly, you should apply the same method for uh, all your images. Otsu is very, it's a very famous method, very commonly used. And uh, what it does is it, it tries to find uh, the value that maximizes the interclass variance between, in the class here, meaning foreground and background. So you can see here that the peak will be, uh, for the interclass variance, will be almost uh, basically this point here. And then you can see the separation, right, in background and foreground. So this is a very common method, for instance. And as post-processing, to refine the binary mask, then there are different uh, uh, methods as well. So we can have, for instance, the few holes operation or filtered objects by size, circularity, for instance. So this one is clearly not uh, uh, well segmented, so you can exclude by circularity. Or watershed. Uh, watershed is a transformation that allows you to uh, separate clustered objects. So you have here, for instance, um, you segment, the segmentation is good, but the objects are still connected. So it allows you to, uh, by applying the watershed transformation on the binary images, you can, for instance, define these uh, lines where uh, if you think that this is a catchment basin and you start filling with water, when the water it, when the meeting points will be the dividing lines of this transformation. So you can divide, you can split clustering nuclei, for instance. So if we summarize here, um, if, coming back to our uh, workflow example, uh, we have pre-processing, segmentation, and post-processing techniques. And 
we can do that for both nuclei and actin to get the outlines of both. But is it good in the case of the cell? Can we post-process it to improve it? And what I want to show here is that not always you get an optimal result. Uh, and finally, uh, you have a set of measurements that you can define. These uh, are examples in Fiji of shape-related measurements, intensity-related measurements, and so on. So I, I recommend that uh, you, you can have a look uh, in, in the Fiji documentation to find, uh, to find out what is the most appropriate measurements for, for, your, for your problem. Okay, so briefly, uh, I just want to mention that we saw a typical workflow with segmentation, filters, and so on, but we can also have uh, machine and deep learning based workflows. Uh, and the idea here is to learn from data. So in a typical machine learning context, you have an input, then you perform feature extraction, and then you are going to train a classifier. So for instance, if the goal is to give images of cats and you can, for instance, classify then at the end. And here we are talking about uh, decision trees, support vector machines, if these names are familiar, uh, maybe these names are familiar to some of you. But in a deep learning approach, um, the, the steps of feature extraction and classification, they come together. So we don't need to hand engineer the kernels anymore. We can let uh, uh, the classifier learn uh these filters uh and it can be you can use this for classification uh, or other image analysis tests and one of them that is important for us is segmentation so a deep learning based segmentation what you provide to the network is a pair of annotated training data so you have the input and uh, uh, so you have label data and then what you expect is to obtain the segmented uh, mask. And you train this with a large number of samples. So when you present, uh, th and this is what we call the training phase. And in the test phase, you can present a new image that was not used to train. And you hope to obtain something like this, what we call instance-based segmentation. So part of the, the training is usually done on the GPU. Uh, uh, it's quite depending on your, of course, uh, data, uh, data size and so on that will be impossible to run locally. So you need a GPU for that. But once the model is trained, you can use this model locally on your co local computer, for instance. And this not only for segmentation, for denoising as well. So here's an example of denoising. So what you train is uh, your training data now is composed of noise and filtered uh, images pairs of noise and corresponding uh, noise and filtered image. So uh, and deep, I mentioned that because deep learning methods have uh, they have been they have been providing much more uh, much better results compared to more traditional uh, segmentation methods. So here is coming back to our workflow as an example, you can see uh, that the cell now is uh, here. I used the uh, cell poles, I guess, uh, and you can see a much better result uh, for the cell segmentation. And here are other examples. Okay, so uh, these methods can be used. So you can use the trained models on your own data. Examples include cell poles and Stardust, two uh, famous uh, algorithms, methods for um, cell and nuclei segmentation. So here you have examples of uh, cell pose, for instance. This is a DIC image uh, of red blood cells. And you can see here the comparison of thresholding and cell pose. So it performs much better. This is a very low contrast image. So I would say quite complex, quite, quite hard task. Um, h &E image. So it's a, it's a generalist algorithm. You can try different image types. Some of you may also be familiar with uh, Weka or Elastic tools, and these are tools. That, and this is uh, for pixel-based classification. So these annotations here, these drawings, were um, uh, made were manually annotated in this image. So you are basically saying that for the same color, you have same classes, and then you can do things like this. 
so you can this is an em image uh, so you by marking a few pixels you can train a classifier so you will have a region based uh, result like this so if deep learning is better in this case, is why do we still use classical approaches? Why did I spend some time here talking about theaters, about classical workflows? Well, uh, the deep learning, we have the deep learning generalization problem. Cellpose works for different types of images, but you may have examples like this, which is also the result of cellpose and uh, not so, uh, not as we expected. We can try to change the diameter, but uh, yeah, you still won't get a good result. So ideally here, you would have to annotate and train this data uh, and not use a trained model. Uh, so some, but sometimes you have lack of annotated training data or small data sets, which wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be feasible to train such as small data sets or even annotate large data sets. That's also complicated. And image analysis is not limited to cell nuclei segmentation. If you want to uh, segment parts of the tissue, then you, uh, you, you need to have a specific, um, specific uh, approaches. So always remember that image analysis is part of this, uh, the, uh, include image analysis as part of your uh, scientific question. So knowing what you need and uh, to retrieve from your images can also ensure image quality. So if you know what you need, you can also adapt acquisition for that. And our brain is still much more efficient than computers in identify pattern, identify, uh, identifying patterns. So uh, you should specify this workflow in a way that you can reply your scientific question. Finally, I'll just uh, briefly talk about software tools I believe here in the slides for you. Uh, of course, it's, it's a lot of tools out there. Uh, these are just a few examples. Um, if you're interested, there's, uh, I think this paper's from last year. Yes, uh, about the future trend in microscopy, smart microscopy, connecting bioimage analysis with fully motorized and computer controlled microscopes. So you would be able, for instance, to, to test things like segmentation even during acquisition uh, time. So I think that's one of the future trends in microscopy. And I will leave some useful links here as well. So sorry for uh, the, the time. And uh, good three minutes. I, if you have any questions. That's OK. So please, if you have questions for Giselle before we go for the little break, then we can just shift so we can have 10 minutes break. Does anyone have questions? Comments? 